I've tweeted and said I'm about to die. I've tweeted from hot air balloons. I've tweeted from camelbacks. I tweeted while flying a plane in French. I just wanted to write the story as it was happening, a real-time narrative. And I think it's the allure of readers on Twitter. They know that whatever I'm writing is happening right now. Good evening, everyone. These are two heroes of mine. Robert Falcon Scott, who was a British Antarctic explorer, and then we have Roald Amundsen, who's Norwegian. They've been done to death by historians, but these were both heroes, they were both explorers who went to Antarctica and tried to achieve the South Pole. We can't travel the same way that they did. They were going to a land that people knew nothing about. No one had even been to the South Pole before, and really people had never traveled to Antarctica. And so this was, this was for them a different kind of adventure than I knew it could be for us today. But still, I feel like the spirit of exploration is alive and that this is something that we can keep on doing today. Now, I tried personally a million different ways to get to Antarctica and failed again and again and again. And getting a, meet, a meeting with Keith Bellows is kind of like seeing the Wizard of Oz. It's very <laughs> tricky. Um, but I managed to arrange it and get in there. But immediately, I pulled out an old map. It was like from the 50s. It was National Geographic map of South America. And I said, you know, I want to travel like these people used to travel. Now, I understand that we have new technologies today, but I want to kind of use these new technologies but have the same kind of adventure. I could get on buses and go most of the way that they went, but it would still be an adventure. And not only that, I had this phone right here that had everything on it. It had a GPS, had a compass. I could send pictures. I could send videos. Everything was here. And I wanted to kind of show that we could still have these same adventures using these new technologies. Miraculously, Keith said yes. And I began to share this experience with my readers on Twitter, on social media, because I wanted this to be a narrative in real time. Now, I'm a believer that there's no such thing as new media. There's only new technology. New media, all that is, is like in using new technology. If you, if you kind of strip all that away, all that we have left are words and pictures. And words and pictures have been around forever. So I was sharing these words and pictures as I was getting ready for my trip. I wanted to share this with all of my readers. Now, if you read the old explorers' books, the first thing that they do is they share what they're bringing. They kind of go through their whole packing list. So I did the same thing. I laid out everything that I was going to take with me. And I took a picture of it and showed people, this is what's inside my pack. Now, I knew that this was going to be a tricky journey because I was traveling overland through so many different climates. And I also knew that my ultimate goal was Antarctica. I'd never been to Antarctica. I figured it was going to be cold. But I couldn't carry all this with me on the bus. So I said, I said you know, how am I, going to, how am I going to do this? Well, I ended up mailing my suitcase. I, I filled it with. Uh, boots and mittens and hats and coats, and I brought it to the post office, and they actually put stamps on my suitcase. Uh, it cost $111, and I mailed it to Argentina. Um, and it was, uh, spoiler, I, it was there when I got there, so I was very happy. Um, so on New Year's Day, I head out from this very building, National Geographic headquarters. It was symbolic. I wanted to show that I was just like these explorers who left, who were sent out by the geographic to go explore the world. And I was going to start from this very point on Earth, and I was going to go to the bottom of the world. And I just got to the bus station on the S2 bus, which runs just outside 16th Street. <laughs> and I paid my fare, which was $1.35, and I got on the bus and took off. And here I am sending my first tweet a real-time narrative. Now, this was an experiment for me because all of the original explorers would go and they would keep a journal and they would write about their trip and then they would come home and actually write a book and publish. And this was a past tense kind of memoir about their journey. Well, I wanted to do the same thing, but I wanted to do it in real time. I just wanted to write the story as it was happening without knowing what was going to happen. Just each few minutes, I was going to send out a message as to what was happening. So right here, I'm tweeting I'm, I'm going by the White House. And then I got to Union Station. And I had not pre-purchased any tickets. I'd only bought my first bus ticket, which was from Washington, DC to Atlanta. And I said, everything after that, I'm just going to make my way south if I keep going south. But I didn't want it to be too planned, because the original explorers, they had a destination in mind, but they didn't always know how they were going to get there. 
So here I am at Union Station presenting my first ticket to the bus driver, and the bus driver looked at me and said, what's your final destination, sir? <laughs> and I turned to him and I was like, Antarctica. <laughs> and he looked at the ticket, he's like, no, you're going to Atlanta. And he's like, get, <laughs> he's like, get on the bus. So I got on the bus, and um, my biggest challenge on the road was keeping my batteries full on, all of, on, on my phone because I was tweeting nonstop and I, um, you know, it just, it just bled the battery. I found that I could tweet for about four or five hours before my phone went out. And here I was taking huge, you know, hu huge long uh, bus, bus trips. And, and you, you learn to kind of form bonds and, and trust other people as you would leave your phone. And we would all take turns watching it while other people went and ate or went, went to the bathroom. But I found out like, that if I just jumped off the bus, even for five minutes and plugged in my phone, I could keep just enough juice to keep going. So I continued to cross the South. I went to Texas. Then I entered Mexico. I was terrified when I entered Mexico because I was so afraid that my 3G coverage would stop. Uh, AT&T had promised me that it would work there, but AT&T, so I wasn't entirely sure. And then <laughs> I, I crossed, and miraculously, it worked. So I crossed all of Mexico, and before I knew it, I was already in Guatemala. Now, in Guatemala, my trip slowed down a bit because no longer was I on these big buses. Guatemala, they use a lot of recycled school buses from the United States. So the school buses that we all ride on, our kids ride on, when they're done, when they go to die, they actually go to Guatemala. And they drive them down there, and they paint them, they decorate them, they're really fancy. And th these school buses keep the entire country connected. The roads in Guatemala are pretty bad. It's a small country, but it feels huge when you're there because it's uh, so hard to get from one place to the next. So I just traveled on these school buses across the entire country. And what was miraculous, I thought, was to cross the whole country of Guatemala. It cost me $6.50. Um, and there's a whole, there's no fixed bus stops. You just jump on the front of the bus and you go and find a seat. And then when you want to get off, you just jump off the back whenever they slow down, out the ex, you know, the rescue emergency door. Uh, so I rode this bus all across, well, several of these buses. Uh, and they call them chicken buses, as you know. And this was a legitimate chicken bus because there were chickens at my feet. Um, you can kind of hear them cackling in the background. But I met some really fun people on this bus. Uh, and this, the bus is their whole life. It's not just about traveling. This is the main form of um, trade. You know, people are bringing all their vegetables and fruit that they're growing and they're selling on the marketplace. They're bringing money home. And this is just, it, it really is the, a way of life. Riding the bus in Guatemala is a way of life for these people. So I traveled through Guatemala, then through El Salvador, then Honduras. And then I got to Nicaragua, and I was very excited because I said, look, I was very kind of proud of myself. I was, look how far I'm getting. I'm actually going to do this. Um, I'm going to at least get through Central America. It had only been a few days. <clears throat> but the problem is I got to Nicaragua and found out that uh, the, they closed the border, and there were no more buses that day to the border with Costa Rica. And then I realized that I actually had a deadline because I was supposed to get on a ship to go through the Panama Canal. Uh, National Geographic Expeditions was, was helping me with this trip, and I, I was supposed to be there the next morning. And I had a whole country to cross, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I thought, well, what would the old explorers do? Would they go sulk in their hotel, or would they find a way to make it work? So I found a way to make it work. Um, I hitchhiked. And I ended up just hitchhiking the whole way. And I made it to San Jose at the airport. I, I fell asleep. And then I met the National Geographic Expeditions people the next day. And I was, I was a wreck. I looked awful. But uh, they, you know, I met them. And I got on my boat and went through the Panama Canal, made it to South America. I finally made it to Ecuador. And this, to me, was the real achievement. Because I am a big map nerd. I love maps. And here I'm on the equator. They have a big um, memorial that says, this is the middle of the world. And they actually have an orange line painted across the middle saying, this is la mitad del mundo. This is, this is it. This is the equator. So I went, and I stood on it, and I tweeted live pictures of me in real time. Here I am standing on the equator. But like I said, I'm a geography nerd. So I took out my phone, got the GPS, and checked it. And we were a couple seconds off the equator. I said, they have mismeasured. And there were thousands of people taking their pictures and standing on the north and southern hemisphere. And I said, no, they're all frauds. This isn't it. I'm going to find the real one. So using my phone, I followed my GPS 
followed, and I had an app for that, because there's an app for everything. And the real equator is about half a mile uh, north of here. Uh, and I got it there, and I was getting closer and closer and closer, and then snap, it all went zero, 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 all the way across my phone. And I drew a line in the sand, and I tweeted it, and I was like, now I'm standing on the real equator. <laughs> so I got back on the bus, and one thing I loved about traveling overland, the advantage to traveling overland to traveling in airplanes, is you can actually see how the Earth changes so slowly, how it just transitions from one landscape into another. And Ecuador, south of Ecuador, is jungle. There's banana plantations everywhere. It's so green. People live in houses that are just shacks with no walls because it's so hot all the time. And suddenly you cross into Peru. And Peru, the north of Peru, is just desert. There's just no water at all. And you drive for 1,000 kilometers through pure coastal desert. I got to Lima, and now I felt like, you know what? This is great. I'm getting there. And then I looked at a map and saw, wow, I still have so far to go. I don't want to waste time. I want to keep going. So I went in to buy my next bus ticket to Bolivia. You only need two things to travel. You need a passport, and you need a credit card. That's all I have. So I showed that to her, got my ticket, and moved on to Bolivia. And then in Bolivia, like in Guatemala, things slowed down a great deal. Because in Bolivia, most of the roads are unpaved. And not only do all the buses break down, but the roads break down. And I was there during the rainy season. And almost every bus I rode on in Bolivia, we got stuck in the mud. And I thought this was a huge catastrophe. But the driver didn't, because the driver just made us all push the bus. So every time we got stuck in the mud, the driver would you know, yell at all of us. And he would stay behind the wheel. And we would all have to go under. So I got very good at pushing. And finally, I made it to the border with Argentina. And I was so excited, because in my mind, this was my final country. I've reached my last country on the journey. The problem with Argentina is it's huge. <laughs> uh, it's like 3,000 miles. It's like driving from LA to New York. That's the, that's the length of Argentina. And uh, again, I, I didn't have any fixed times, except I did have a boat I had to get on in, uh, in Ushuaia. So I went full on crossed Argentina in about seven days, which is a beautiful country, and driving across La Pampa in the bus for two days, just green farm fields, and then driving through Patagonia on a bus was, uh, for me, just such a romantic endeavor. Um, I really got that sense of travel when, when you go overland through Argentina. It's another journey I recommend. But like all trips, uh, it's only worth it if there's a time where you think you're going to die. And <clears throat> for me, that was the end of uh, Argentina. When I finally got to Tierra del Fuego, I was getting ready to cross. I was ecstatic to have finally reached the Strait of Magellan. This marked the final boundary between me and my destination and getting on my ship to Antarctica. However, the sea was too rough to cross, and so we waited. And yet by late afternoon, the seas had picked up and had become completely impassable. We waited for hours, and the line of traffic behind us stretched for almost five miles. Eventually, the bus driver invited me to the front of the bus, along with several of his pretty Argentine companions, and we drank mate, which is the Argentine pastime of passing time. Has anyone drank mate before? It's great stuff, and uh, it's how it's how I we sat for 12 hours waiting for the waves to calm down, and we drank a lot of mate in those 12 hours. When it got dark and the waves picked up, that's when the ferry decided to go. And so we went out on the ferry, and it's only three miles across the Strait of Magellan. And about halfway across the strait, they, they thought, this is too dangerous, and they turned around to go back. But our boat got blown down the strait. And so at that point, it was just we, we had to get across. It was really scary. Uh, I live tweeted it and said, I'm about to die. And everybody on the bus was crying. Um, it took us an hour to cross this three-mile strait because the seas were so bad. And when we got to the other side, it started snowing. Now, this is their summer. This is the, the, you know, the Southern Hemisphere summer, and it started snowing. And you're in Chile, actually, when you cross this part, a little sliver of Chile. And then you get back into Argentina. So I made it to Ushuaia. I got off the last bus, and it's in a parking lot. And it was just so weird for me to think. I had left uh, this corner in Washington, DC. And 40 days later, I got off in a parking lot. And it was, it's the end of the road. It's the end of the. Uh, Pan American Highway. It's the southernmost piece of pavement in the world. And there was the National Geographic Explorer, the ship that I was going to take. Uh, two days later, we reached Antarctica. 
and I was still in disbelief that I had actually made it overland this far. Uh, the weather was horrible, it was snowing, and I was smiling because it's exactly how I wanted Antarctica to be. And we got in a rubber boat and sped to shore, and I finally set foot on the Antarctic continent. I was below the Antarctic Circle. I stood on this rock, I unfurled the National Geographic flag that I had carried, and for a split second, I felt that joy and that great honor of being a National Geographic explorer, of really doing something different and traveling in a way that was different and achieving a far end of the world that not that many people get to go to. The overland portion of the journey was exactly 10,000 miles long. I rode 40 buses and it took me 40 days, actually, to get there. And I added up all my bus tickets and it's $1,102.63. Um, and my phone bill for tweeting was more than that. But, uh, <laughs> but to me, it was, it was such an amazing way to travel. And the thing that was most remarkable about it is it made the Earth feel very small. Because before, I would always look at a map of the world and it seemed so immense. But once you've driven across the Earth, um, it, it actually, it's, it's, we live on a very small planet. And, and I can say that now because I've, I've, seen, I've seen half of it. So, we kind of decided at National Geographic to move this to the next level. Now, I want to take you back to the very first National Geographic magazine. First issue, first page, first paragraph of National Geographic, 1888. This is when the, the founding fathers of National Geographic sat down and said, what are we about? And they said, the National Geographic Society has been organized to increase and diffuse geographic knowledge, and a magazine has been determined upon as one means as one means of accomplishing these purposes. This is the important line, I want you to all pay attention. In hopes that it may become a channel of intercommunication. Now, these guys were visionaries. They didn't just say, let's have a magazine and we wanna take pretty pictures for people to look at and we want to help people with school projects and we wanna teach schoolboys about female anatomy. It, was, it wasn't that at all, it was a channel of intercommunication. Now, I don't know any better explanation of social media than what they've described here 124 years ago, a channel of intercommunication, and that is what Twitter is. Now, the problem with Twitter is its name. It's called Twitter. If we called it the system, or if we called it the matrix, then I think we'd take it a lot more seriously. And what's even worse is the word tweeting, because when we say tweet, it almost sounds impolite, like I tweeted. <laughs> And, but really, it's, in my opinion, this is literature. And I learned something because I sent over 5,000 tweets when I traveled from Washington, D.C. to Antarctica. And I learned that there was a more effective way to write on Twitter and a less effective. And for those who don't know Twitter, you know, it's a, it's a way to share by text message. You're limited to 140 characters, so you have to keep it really short. But you can say so much if you do it right. Now, I didn't start out as a pro, I'm still not a pro, but I'm learning. And I learned a lot from poets. This is one of my favorite poems um, by Jack Kerouac. It's from his American Haiku, written in 1959. Nightfall, boy smashing dandelions with a stick. Now this follows an ancient Japanese form of poetry, but it's very short and it has all the great ingre ingredients of a tweet, of storytelling. He has set the stage. He's given you time, he's given you place, he's given you color, he's given you a character, and he's given you action. And you need all of these things when you're writing Twitter. And so I read a lot of the Beat Poets, I always have, and I really like uh, their stuff. But I tried to incorporate this when I was writing. The difference with Twitter, and I think what's exciting about it, is we're not sitting there with pen and paper, paper thinking and trying to come up with the best thing. We're doing it immediately. We're writing and publishing at the same time. And this is the challenge, but it's also the excitement. And I think it's the allure of readers on Twitter, and especially my readers, because they know that whatever I'm writing is happening right now. So I tried out different experiments. And one of the first experiments I did with Twitter, I just wrote tweets. I just wrote haiku. I followed traditional haiku patterns. And sometimes I would try to make them more poetic, but sometimes I would just talk about what was actually happening. You don't have to stick to the form, the five, seven, five syllables of haiku. I expanded. So this is a tweet I wrote on my trip to Antarctica. Passing through a three-light bulb town, young girls rest hands on one another's shoulders. Boys on two small bikes swerve in the dirt. 
Now again, you can't have any artificial ingredients. If you haven't seen these things when you're traveling, you can't write them. But in an instant, I saw all of these things from the bus and I wanted to share them, so I did. Now people still really criticize Twitter. A lot of people say this isn't literary, it's just people chatting. If you don't really understand, a lot of it looks like, um, it looks like some secret code when, you, when you're looking at all of these different signals and everything. But I, uh, I believe that Twitter can be literary and I believe that it can actually serve a higher purpose. So now we had evolved what we had started out with, which was this one journey of exploration to Antarctica into something bigger. You know, Keith christened me the digital nomad. He said, you're going to go out and you're going to keep doing this and we're going to experience different places. So I, I kind of honed my pack. I got rid of a couple of the things I didn't need. I added a couple more. I think that what I do is different than a lot of the traditional National Geographic photographers because they have more time. I often will have five minutes to do something. So I've got to know exactly what tool I'm going to use. I have to find it in my bag and grab it and pull it out and do it. And if I don't, if it's, you know, I need to charge it immediately or anything, I need to be able to access everything in very short time. My office is the whole world. It changes every day, no matter where I go. But when you're traveling in the middle of nowhere and you have a picture and you know you've got to get it in before 9 a.m. Washington, D.C. time, that's a real challenge. I took this picture in the Great Barrier Reef of these clownfish. I wanted to show people that clownfish actually have scientific names. It's not just Nemo. And I set up my portable satellite. But the sailboat, you know, it's, we're at sea. So the sailboat's going all over the place. So this picture took me about four hours to upload. But we got it in time. We published it. Taking good pictures is extremely difficult. Uh, this is all about being in the right place. And that's why travel and photography go so well together. And this is an old mantra from National Geographic. All the photographers, it's a saying that's going around forever. And that, that's F8, which is the, you know, your aperture, wide open. So F8 and be there. And that motto has become very important for me, be there. Because if you want to take good pictures, you need to be in the place where the pictures are happening. I've tweeted from hot air balloons. I've tweeted from birch bark canoes. I've tweeted above Niagara Falls in a helicopter. I've tweeted from camelbacks. And I've tweeted not underwater. That doesn't work yet, but almost. I tweeted in real time while flying a plane in French. So I'm tweeting in French here. I'm in Quebec, and I'm flying a Piper Cub. Uh, I'm about 1,000 feet off the ground. This is my first flying lesson, and I wanted to tweet while I was flying. Uh, I never tweet when I'm driving, only when I'm flying. Um, now, I just want to leave with a couple of little tips for all of you digital nomads out there, things that, things that I've learned that, that have helped me. One, besides being there, which is very important, always be there, never let the experience of, you know, never let sharing the experience eclipse having the experience. And that's very possible. You can walk into any coffee shop here and you're going to see a million people with their phones looking down like this. And it's very hard to experience the world around you when you're doing this. This is in Botswana, in the Okavango Delta, beautiful place, surrounded by wildlife. And I was with two journalists from New York. And we're out there surrounded by lions and everything else. And all they cared about was that there was no reception on their phone. And there was one spot by the river uh, near the Namibian border where there was a wildebeest carcass. And they always wanted to drive by the carcass because the carcass, for whatever reason, had coverage. So they could always <laughs> download their email and their tweets whenever we got by the carcass. So they were like, let's go to the carcass, let's go to the carcass. And they were so obsessed with that, they missed out everything else that we were around. And if you're so obsessed with kind of sharing the experience, you miss the things that are around you. And the third thing is always use the right tool. Just like uh, Amundsen used dogs, always use the right tool when you're out someplace. Sometimes video is going to be the best tool. Sometimes Twitter is going to be the best tool. Sometimes it's good to do Facebook or YouTube or whatever. But think about it before you record and share. There's one fourth tip that I have, and I'll close with this. And that is you have to unplug periodically. To be a good digital nomad, you also have to be a really good analog homebody. And I'm a really good analog homebody. I love coming home switching off my phone, switching everything off, and being home. 
And if you don't, um, you just become crazed because the human mind works very different than our digital technology. Our minds are fascinating. We have subconsciouses that are always working. We take much better pictures than cameras do. We feel a place. We have these emotions. But if we don't shut off, we're not able to process that and share it. So I'll just leave with that. You should unplug. You will sleep much better if you do. And I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and listening to my stories. Really grateful.